Israel had been under foreign occupation for over 500 years. They longed for the prophesied Messiah with the hope that he would lead them to vanquish their oppressors. God's chosen king sent to usher in the world to come to rule in power over his chosen people. The hope that God's anointed ruler would finally punish the empires that kept them under their boot. And so the Messiah finally came, but not as a warlord or an avenging king or through power at all. He came born in a stable to a scared young mother as something much, much more. Picture all of history on a string, on a, on a, on a timeline, all of history. And then you just randomly kind of go along that line of history and you pick one little spot, one moment. I'll grab a random one. Here you go. You ready? Boom. September 16th, 1962. You know the amazing thing that happened that day, the incredible history changing thing, right? That's when I was born, okay? <laughs> September 16th, 1962. And you know what? The next year, it was just 1963. It didn't change history. It didn't define history. We all have those moments. We are born those moments along the timeline. But the moment we talk about today, the birth of Jesus, where, where God left heaven and became Emmanuel, God with us, born in a manger, that moment on the timeline, watch us now, that moment when Jesus came, right there, boom, there it is. That moment was called zero. Why do you say that? Because everything before that is called B.C., 100 B.C., 700 B.C., and everything after it is called A.D., Anno Domine, the year of our Lord. Do you understand that all of history is divided on the zero of Jesus coming? Because that changed the world. His dot on the timeline defines everything. And, and, and this Christmas season, we're, we're thinking about this reality. We're thinking about the idea that, that in the Bible, in this book that God's given to us, the first two-thirds of this book, called the Old Testament, are filled with prophecies, predictions. And one of the things that the prophets and the poets and the kings pointed to was that one day a Messiah would come. One day a Savior would come. And some of these prophecies prophesied in the book of Isaiah and in the Psalms and, 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 and throughout the Old Testament, some of these prophecies are, are pointing ahead 700 years or 1,000 years. Over 60 prophecies, all pointing that one day a Messiah will come. Where, where the Messiah will be born? Bethlehem. But where the Messiah will come from? Nazareth. Who the Messiah will be? Emmanuel, God with us. Anything interesting about the Messiah? Well, born of a virgin. All these things are pointed to by the prophets. That he would come and give his life for lost and broken people. All prophesied. And after 700 years, after 1,000 years, after all these prophecies, they all coalesced, they all came together when Jesus Christ came. And in Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, over 60 prophecies became fulfilled in this one person because he was and he is the Messiah. So the prophets prophesied. When Jesus came, it defined time the year of our Lord, or B.C., and now in our world today, in our lives today, does, does all that still matter? Does all that still make a difference? And the answer is yes. Because the one who came, the one who was prophesied to come as Prince of Peace is still the Prince of Peace today. And when we walk with him, we walk in his peace. Because the one who was prophesied to be Emmanuel, God with us, is still with us. The one who said he would come and die for our sins still offers himself to us. And so when we look at this coming of Jesus, and when we think about Christmas, it's the, it's the picture of the manger. It's the baby. And that's an important part of Christmas. But, but for Jesus, it's the whole story. If we just leave Jesus in the manger, we miss the reason why he came. He came to give himself. He came to sacrifice, to serve, and to save. That's why Jesus came. He came out of love for us. And when somebody shows up asking the, asking the question, well, why are you here? It matters. You know, why, why does somebody just show up? Imagine for a minute, imagine you're in your home, and it's evening time, 
It's kind of dark out. It's quiet. And you're not expecting any company. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. You're not expecting it. So you kind of get up and you go to the door. You don't just throw the door open. It's nighttime. And, and so you, know, you kind of send there and you go, you go, who's there? And a voice comes back from the other side. I'm a robber. <laughs> well, what do you plan on doing? I'm a robber. I plan on robbing you. Now, at this point, what emotions come to your, you know, you're like, you're, you're not throwing the door open. You're not, the, the, the reason they're coming determines your emotional response and your physical response to them. You don't open the door for someone like that. Now, same scenario, you're home, it's nighttime, it's kind of quiet, you're not expecting any company. Knock on the door. You go to the door. Who's there? And the voice, a familiar voice comes back. It's Otto. Oh, Otto, how you doing? Now, all of a sudden, flashing through your mind is all your interactions with Otto. Otto's the neighbor who borrows things and doesn't return them. Otto's the neighbor who borrows things, and if he does return them, they're broken or they're dirty, and they're not well taken care of. Otto's the person who always has a favor for you to do for him. And so now you're standing at your door, and it's a different set of emotions. It's not the same emotions you have if a robber's there, but it's not, come on in. There's kind of caution involved, because that's how people respond. Now, imagine you're in, your, you're in your home, it's nighttime, it's dark, it's quiet, you're not expecting any company, and all of a sudden, a knock on the door. And you come to the door, and you say, who's there? And the voice comes back, it's Jesus. And you say, what do you want? Why are you here? And he says, I've come to serve you. I've come to sacrifice myself for you. I've come to save you from all your fears and all your brokenness and all your wrongs. But if you, have, if you have any sense at all, and if you believe what he's saying is true, you say, come on in. Because when somebody comes to serve and sacrifice and save, boy, you want to know that person. That's what the Messiah came for. And, and, and we can, you know, some people can look at that and say, well, you know, that whole idea about, you know, about Jesus, you know, sacrificing his life and all, you know, I don't understand what that's all about. You know, I think we actually do want, we understand the nature of relationships. When you love someone, when you care about someone, when you really love them and care about them, you sacrifice for them. It's true in every deep and meaningful relationship. Think about, think about parents. Parents serve and sacrifice. We, you know, kids don't fully get that, even as they're growing up and if they start to get a perspective, they don't fully get it. I remember for me, you know, I, I didn't really think about how my parents had served and sacrificed until Sherry and I had not one, not two, but three children. It took, it took three kids and raising three kids until finally I had this moment where I realized, wow, my parents did this. Now, my parents' story is interesting because my parents had two children. That was their plan. They were going to have a boy, then a girl. You know, you know how you plan your future? You know how that works, right? Never like you plan, right? My parents' plan was to have a boy and a girl. So they had Allison. They had a girl. So they thought, well, we'll have a girl and a boy. So they had Gretchen. So they had two girls. And they stopped having kids. And then I came along. I won't give you any details, but my dad would often refer to me affectionately as his diaphragm baby. Um, and uh, the younger teenagers can ask your parents later. Um, so nine years go by. Nine years go by, and my parents have another child, who my dad affectionately referred to as his IUD baby. <laughs> no, it's not a sermon on birth control, but, but I'm, you know. So then my brother Jason is born. Now, 10 years after me, and he's what my, my, my dad, my dad's a funny guy, but he'd say, oh, he's my little vasectomy baby. <laughs> and my dad just says, when you got it, you got it. But, uh, um, but... My parents stopped after having two kids. They were done, and they had five. And so after, after we have our third son, and I remember one day I'm, I'm thinking about all the diapers and all the late nights and all the challenges of raising kids. I called my parents. I said two words. You know what they were? Thank you. Thank you. And I said, with, I said thank you for, I, I said, I didn't know. I didn't know how much you love, how much you cared. I'm starting to get a picture of it now. We know that when you love someone, when you care about somebody deeply, you will serve and you will sacrifice. It's true, it's true with raising children. It's true in a marriage. 
A marriage doesn't work unless both people say, I will serve, I will sacrifice. It won't work over the long haul in a beautiful way, the way it's supposed to work, unless both will serve and both will, both will sacrifice. It works, it's just like in a friendship, a true friendship. You serve each other, you sacrifice. And that's how it works with Jesus. Jesus, who is the good shepherd. And Jesus says the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. See, the Christmas story begins in a manger. It's a beautiful picture of God leaving heaven, coming born among us in human flesh. But the, the Christmas story includes not just the manger, but the life of Jesus, the cross of crucifixion, his burial for three days, his resurrection, his ascension, and his coming again. That's all part of the Christmas story. And so today, as we think about Christmas, I want us to think about the whole story, that Jesus came to serve to sacrifice, and to save. That's what he came for. That's what he came to do. And we see this in an ancient prophecy pointing to the coming of the Messiah. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 53. I will also have the words of this, of this portion of scripture on the screens as well. And I want to walk through a part of Isaiah 53. And what I want you to hear is that this prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus comes, is pointing and saying, this is who the Messiah will be. It's a prophetic word. And when you read this and you realize what Jesus did and why he came, it lines up perfectly with what Jesus came and did 700 years later. And so if there's a knock on the door and you say, who's there? And Isaiah says, I want to tell you about this Jesus who's knocking on the door, who wants to know you, who's come to serve and to sacrifice, and to save. This is what Isaiah writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, 700 years earlier, pointing to the coming of the Messiah and fulfilled in Jesus. He, he writes, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no majesty or beauty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. But surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah says, that's who the Messiah will be. That's what the Messiah will do. That's why Jesus came. And that begins in the manger, but it's fulfilled on the cross and in the empty tomb. It's all one story. So when you look in the manger, don't just think of that moment. Think of why he came. And he came to serve us, to sacrifice himself for us, and to save us. So there's a knock on the door. Who is this Jesus? Why has he come? And Isaiah continues to answer that question in verse 6 of Isaiah 53. He says, we all like sheep, we've gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, on the Messiah that's being prophesied, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. And he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had no, done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah is saying, he will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he will willingly, gladly, by his own choice, suffer and serve for the sake of those he wants to save. Man, someone like that comes knocking on your door. That only happens once. 
There's only one that can knock on your door and say, I can do all that. Because he, he serves and he suffers, but he also saves. And so the knock comes. Who is this Jesus? Why did he come? What's he all about? And Isaiah finishes this story in verse 10 of Isaiah 53. He says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, the very life of Jesus, an offering for our wrongs, for our sins, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and I will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he, Jesus the Messiah, poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This Messiah who came, this Jesus born in the manger, he was not the Messiah that was expected, but he's exactly the Messiah that was needed. In the first century, they were expecting a powerful military conqueror to overcome the Romans who were leaning hard on the people of God. And they were wanting somebody, somebody to come in with power and military might cast off their oppression. And Jesus came humbly born in a manger. He said, I've come to sacrifice, to serve, to suffer, to lay my life down for you that you might be saved. That's the message of Christmas. That's what Isaiah was prophesying. That's why Jesus came among us. It's, it's, not, it's not just a Christmas card. It's not just a postcard. It's not just, isn't that cute, a baby in a manger? We're talking about God, eternal God, God of very God coming among us as one of us and giving his life for us. Does all that make any difference now? Oh, it makes all the difference in the world. Because the Bible talks about how Jesus knocks. And I love this. The Bible doesn't say Jesus kicks the door in. He doesn't. He just knocks. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who opens the door, I will come in. And it says, I will share a meal with him. I'll have fellowship. In the ancient world, table fellowship, sitting and having a meal around a table was the most intimate kind of fellowship possible. They didn't sit at tables like we did. They reclined at tables along the ground. And it was close. It was intimate. And Jesus says, I want to have that kind of relationship with you. That's the message of Christmas. And I know the heart of Jesus is to say, if you know me, boy, come near to me, closer than you've ever been. I didn't share this in the last service, but I want, I want to say, it's on, it's on my heart to say it, so I'm just going to say it. Um, some of you come to gather with God's people a couple times a year, and I want to invite you. We gather every single Sunday for three times at Shoreline, year round. And I, I, I want to say, Jesus' arms are open and the church's arms are open, and I want to just give an invitation to, to Come be among God's people and be inspired to keep growing in your faith. If you know Jesus, keep tep taking steps closer and know that he came to, to serve you and to sacrifice for you and to save you, but he also wants to have a relationship with you. And we want to encourage you to grow in that. And if you're here and you say, I don't, I don't really know who this Jesus is yet. I haven't made that step yet. I want to encourage you to explore that. You can even call our church and say, I'd like to meet with a pastor and talk about the whole Christianity thing. We, we will have a pastor meet with anyone who calls and wants to talk about that. And after the service, on the way out, on the right-hand side, there's a table with some Bibles in English and in Spanish. If you want a Bible that's in, like, common, if you got to, like, your, yeah, I have a Bible that's all these and nows. It's hard to read. We have Bibles that are modern English. We want to give you that as a Christmas gift on your way out in English and Spanish. But, but the, the, the prophets prophesied, over 60 prophecies, a Messiah will come. Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies. And he's here, and he's present with us today. And Jesus Christ is now the light of the world. And his light shines in us, and his light shines through us. So I want to pray, and then we're going to just kind of picture how the light of Jesus can be impacting the world if each of us bear some of that light in a candle lighting time. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've called us to come to you, that you knock on the door. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't kick in the door, you don't barge in, you don't break in. You offer yourself 
You laid your life down. You have sacrificed. You have served. And Jesus, only you can save. So I pray that this Christmas season, we will celebrate you. We will draw closer to you. And if we're not quite sure who you are, we will ask good questions and dig into this question that means so much. Who is this Jesus? Why did he come? Does he care about me? Jesus, thank you for a chance to be together like this. Touch our hearts in this moment, and we pray in your name. Amen. In just a moment, our ushers are going to start lighting candles at the end of each row. And I'm going to ask you if, you, if you, if you have kids that are too little to handle a candle, you hold a candle for them. And if they can handle it, and you can kind of help them keep it up nice and straight. Uh, we'll spend hours this week cleaning up wax, which is great. We just don't need to overdo it. So, uh, and so when your candle is lit, everybody look, up, everybody look up here. When your candle is lit, don't do this. Don't go like this. Let me light your candle and throw wax at the person. Keep your candle like this, and then the other person will come in like this and light their candle. Unlit candle like this, lit candle. Held, everybody getting this? All right. And so I want to invite you to stand with us, and I invite our ushers to start lighting the candles. And be patient, the light will come to you. And we're going to sing Silent Night together. As you look at the candle, think about the light of Jesus. Look around the room and see how that light can shine. Let's stand together. together with just the voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
One of the scriptures that talks about Jesus talks about the fact that he is the light of the world. But the Bible also says that we are the light of the world if Christ lives in us. If you want to get a picture of how that could impact our world, if you're in the front row here in the main floor, turn around and just look back for a second. Just turn around and look around. Um, if each of us bears the light of Jesus, if we serve like he served, if we sacrifice like he sacrificed, we can't save like he saved, but we can point people to the one who does save. We can point them to Jesus. I want to invite you uh, as we go from here to come back next Sunday morning. We're going to actually have communion together as a congregation the last Sunday of the year. We'd invite you to come be part of that. And then next year, we kick off a series called Longings. And the whole series just talks about the longing of the human heart, that we all long for love and for joy and for peace. And we're going to look at how do we find those things that our souls long for. And so we, we're so thankful that you came to join us, and if you want to get a Bible on the way out of here, if you're, if you're new at Shoreline and you want to learn more about the church, you can go out these doors to the left, to the Connection Center, and they want to give you a little gift. Thank you for coming, a little Christmas gift for you, and answer any questions you have about the church. But I want to invite you, when I count to three, we are going to uh, blow the candles out. I'm going to give you a word of blessing. I'm going to go one, two, three, we're going to blow the candles out, and then we're going to go in the light of Jesus, and we're going to bear his light. So as you go from this place Go walking in his light, filled with his light, and understanding that the Jesus who serves, who suffered, and who saves is alive and wants to lead your life. Go in his peace. Amen? Amen. And let's blow him out. One, two, three. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah.